that this week. Okay, so no Job this week. We'll look at Job next week. Uh, so on October the 7th, I joined 1,800 pastors and lay people in Chicago. And there's a one-day worship service prayer conference as we cried out to God on behalf of the United Methodist Church. It's called the Wesleyan Covenant Association. And many have asked me what happened at that event and what was it like and what was going on. And uh, to fully explain what happened at that event, we really have to back up and look at the founder of the Methodist Church, John Wesley. And so as I was praying about that, the Lord laid on my heart a scripture uh, from James chapter 2. We're going to start with verse 14. You will grab your Bibles, stand in honor of the Word of God as we read this together. James 2, verse 14 through 24. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a, a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, and one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God good. Even the demons believe that there is one God and shudder. You foolish me. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was it not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is just, justified by what he does and not by faith alone. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So one of the things I, I want us to take a moment as we allow this James passage to lead us uh, is that we need to talk for a moment about faith and how James says faith without works is dead. But yet Paul in the book of Romans says we are saved by faith apart from the works of the law. So these two phrases seem to be in conflict with one another. And so we need to understand something. And uh, the best way to look at it, I think, is what Chuck Swindoll said. He said that uh, in the book of Romans, Paul is talking about faith as our root. It is our substance for our walk in Christ. We are saved by Thing. What Jesus did on the cross is what, is what brings us salvation. Period. We cannot add to what God has done. We've got to be careful. We don't add to what God has done. But then James is not talking about the roots. James is talking about the fruit that comes from the tree. So if our roots are deep in realizing that Jesus died for our sins and what he did on the cross brings us salvation, then there will be fruit in our lives. Our lives will be different because we have faith in Jesus Christ. That's where the two come together. Now, as we think about John Wesley and as we think about the founder of the United Methodist Church, one of the things we have to understand is he is one that was rooted strongly in this passage. He had a heart to God. He believed that we are called to worship 
and to serve God. And so our heart to Him came out in our hands to other people. Now there was a song that Jeff Moore made popular in the 1990s called A Heart to God and a Hand to Man. And it was actually written about the Salvation Army. But the Salvation Army started from the United Methodist Church or the Methodist Church. When um, William and Catherine Booth launched the Sal Salvation Army, they came out of the United Methodist Movement. But this is what that song says. Part of it. If a man is hungry, give him food to eat. If a stranger is thirsty, give him drink. If a woman's battered, if a child abandoned, bring them in, give them what they need. A heart to God and a hand to man. Here begins the healing of our land. A heart to God and a hand to man. I can still hear the hallelujah band. A heart to God and a hand to man like an army marching as to war come to set the captives free. A heart to God and a hand to man. It was in a very a time of great turmoil where John Wesley came on the scene. Europe was in turmoil. Child labor, drunkenness, people could not walk the streets because of fear of being robbed or murdered. The Church of England, from which John Wesley was a member, believed that, well, if you just have a higher steeple, people will come to worship. And they know where we are, so they ought to come to us. But John Wesley's heart was different. He believed we ought to take the gospel to them. Let's have a little video to help us understand that, that part of John Wesley's life. In a dark time when the church had lost its way, God created a movement that would change the world. As a nation's economy moved from agrarian to industrial, a few reaped the benefits and amassed great wealth. But many were displaced and marginalized. Life was cheap. Children labored in the harshest of conditions. Drunkenness and debauchery were common and the masses lived in poverty and squalor. At the same time, the church had become powerless and ineffective, unconcerned about the physical needs of the poor or the spiritual desperation of the lost. Content to be little more than a social institution, the church was irrelevant to the brokenness it was created to heal. But God, in his love for the world, warmed the heart of a young clergyman at a prayer meeting on Aldersgate Street. Who would later write, I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. With passion and power, John Wesley began to preach salvation by grace alone, called upon the followers of Jesus to live holy lives and work for the transformation of society. Misunderstood, opposed, and even attacked by the very church he loved and desired to save, John Wesley would not be deterred. Proclaiming the gospel in the coal mines and the open fields, riding on horseback over a quarter of a million miles, preaching 40,000 sermons and organizing new believers into small groups for encouragement and accountability. Wesley began a mighty movement that would convert hundreds of thousands, save a nation, and revive the church. Methodism crossed the Atlantic to a new land, taking to heart Wesley's charge to be prepared at a moment's notice to pray, preach, or die. 
the early circuit riders struck out into the American frontier. So difficult and dangerous was their mission that half of them died before they were 30 years old. But because of their sacrifice, for decades, Methodism would be the most powerful movement of God on the continent, reforming the morals of a nation and reaching lost souls who needed to hear the gospel. To understand John Wesley, we have to go back a little bit to the time in which he lived. Let's talk a little bit about it. But John Wesley's father, Samuel Wesley, was a pastor. Um, and he was not liked much by the people uh, in the community in which he lived. And so, uh, one afternoon, uh, someone came when John Wesley was six years old and set the house ablaze. And John Wesley was in the second story crying out for people to help him and he was rescued just before the house collapsed upon itself. And he said over and over uh, in his sermons uh, that he was a brand plucked out of the fire. And then repeatedly, he used this phrase. He said, light yourself on fire with passion for God, and people will come from miles around to watch you burn. To understand him, we also have to understand not only his father, who was an Anglican priest, but his mother, Susanna Weston. She had 19 children. Ten of those children died within the first year. So John Wesley had eight siblings growing up. And so in the midst of this life, how do you take care of all these kids, right? So Susanna Wesley had some rules, and I'm sure this went into John Wesley's life. Uh, 16 rules. Those of you that are parents, write these down because they're very important rules. Eating between meals is not allowed in our home. Number one. As children, they are to be in bed by 8 p.m. Good rule. They are required to take medicine without complaining. Subdue self-will and those working together with God to save a child's soul. Teach a child to pray as soon as they can speak. Require all to be still during family worship time. There's two parts to that, by the way. Require your children to be still during worship, but also during family worship. Begs a question. Do you have worship in your home? Is the Bible opened up? Is there time to seek the Lord as a family together? And she says, give them nothing they cry for and only that when asked for politely. Never allow a sinful act to go unpunished. Never punish a child twice for a single act. Attempt, any attempt to please, even if poorly performed, should be commended. Preserve property rights, even in the smallest of items. Strictly observe all promises. Require no daughter to work before she can read well. Teach your children to fear the rod. She had to have these rules with all those kids running around. But you gotta think in the heart and in the mind of John Wesley that he had to have learned some things from his mother. At one point in time, she was having a Bible study in their home. Uh, and in this Bible study, she started at two o'clock in the afternoon on Sundays, purposely after worship. 
She was having over 200 people come to her Bible study. The pastor of the church where her husband was the pastor, but he was uh, at a church serving in London at the time, wrote her husband to get him to stop her from having Bible study in her home. He's pulling away all my members. You know what I would have done? I would have gone to her Bible study. She's got something going on that wasn't going on in worship. It's from these roots, from this understanding that John Wesley was raised. He longed to be a professor at Oxford, so he went to Oxford. And while he was there, which was common among the day, uh, he was ordained an Anglican priest. His heart was to teach, but he was ordained a pastor. While he was there, he, they formed what was called the Holy Club. Him and Charles Wesley and George Whitfield and a few others started a club where they would get together, they would read the word together, and they would hold each other accountable in their Christian walk. Part of what happened at each meeting is they would say, how's your walk with God? Where have you failed God this week? And if a person confessed where they had failed God, they would then pray for that person. But then the next week when they would get together, they would say, how are you doing in your walk with God? You know, last week you talked about this sin in your life. How are you doing with it? And they held each other accountable in their Christian walk. Oh Lord, don't we need a revival in that? Not a way for people to point fingers at one another, for a way that people can love, come alongside one another and pray for each other and help us in our walk with God. So I don't know about you, but I need that in my life. People to say, Charles, how are you doing in this area? I've got some pastor friends that help me because I know that one of the areas I struggle in my life is to spend quality and quantity family time. Not just quality, it's important, but quantity as well. And so they'll call me or they'll text me and say, how are you doing in this area? Have you sat on the floor and played a board game with your kids this week? Have you read a book with them? Have you spent time with them? And by that, Holding me accountable, I have to either say, no, I didn't. Well, what's wrong? Sit on the floor. Or I say, yes, through the grace of God, we, we did this and we did this and we laughed about this and we had this time together. I know I need those to hold me accountable in that area of my life. And that's part of what the Holy Club did, is they held each other accountable. But then John Wesley uh, was asked to go to the Americas uh, to preach to the Indians. In 1735, he came to America. While he was on the boat, um, there was a terrible storm, and they thought that they were all going to perish because of the storm. But over in the corner, there was a group of German Moravians that were praising God, their whole family. They were just singing and having a great time. They were having a worship service. After the storm passed, John kind of got himself out of hiding. He went over and asked the pastor of this Moravian group, how could you do that? And the Moravian pastor asked him, do you have full, the fullness of salvation in Christ Jesus? And John Wesley told him yes, but he wrote in his diary, oh, I don't know if I do for sure. It's a time of struggle for him. The, the trip to the Americas uh, was not a good thing for uh, John Wesley. He wrote in his diary, I went to America to convert the Indians, but who shall convert me? 
He left defeated, went back to England. One of the things that happened that was going on in his heart and his life is he was engaged to a woman while he was in America. She married another man. So he became bitter. She came to him because he was her pastor for communion and he refused to give her communion. You know what she did? She sued him to make him give her communion. Very hard time in his life. During this time, he then went, and the video talked about this a little bit, he went to a Bible study uh, where it was a prayer meeting, and they were reading the preface to the book of Romans by Martin Luther. So it wasn't even opening the Bible, it was just listening to Martin Luther's introduction to the book of Romans. And at that event, John Wesley accepted Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. He wrote this, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I trusted in Christ alone for salvation and assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. That Jesus had saved even me. Shortly after that, one of the men that he was in the Holy Club with George Whitfield came to John Wesley and asked him to go preach in the fields for all the mine workers going to the mine. John Wesley at first said, no, they know where the church is, they ought to go there. How many of us, we were to confess, might have the same attitude. Do you know that's why we built big steeples? So people can find the church. They know where we are. Well, George Whitfield finally convinced John Wesley to go preach in the fields. The first time he preached, over 3,000 coal miners stopped to hear him preach. Within one month, 47,000 coal miners heard the salvation of Jesus Christ. One man observing the coal miners talked about how he saw the traces of tears in these coal miners' faces as they surrendered themselves to the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. The revival began to break out in England. On one occasion, John Wesley was going from one church to another after preaching and abandoned, stole all his money. And John Wesley said to this uh, man, stop, I have something more to give you. And the man came back thinking, oh, he has a watch or he has something else. And John Wesley said, my friend, you may live to regret this sort of life. If you ever do, there's something to remember. The blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you from all sin. A couple of years later, John was preaching back in this community. And he saw a wealthy businessman walk up. And he realized it was that thief. And that thief came to him and said, I owe everything to you. And John Wesley said, oh no, my friend, not to me, but to the blood of Jesus Christ. And his forgiveness and his grace. John Wesley said, give me 100 men who fear God and nothing but sin and desire to serve God and we will shake the gates of hell. It's a man that realized that as his prayer said, I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what you will. Let me be employed for thee or laid aside for thee. For thee, let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I am freely and heartily yield all things to thy good pleasure and disposal. 
Thou art mine, and I am thine. Oh, Lord. What a prayer. Someone who is willing to surrender all to the Lord. John Wesley became a very wealthy man. His father, Samuel, was not very wealthy, and with all the siblings that were in that family, they lived very poorly. But John Wesley became wealthy because he sold tracts, Christian tracts, that talked about what it is to walk in Christ. His first year as a pastor, he earned 30 pounds. A woman came to his door one evening, one very cold evening. And it just so happened that evening he was placing two new pictures that he just purchased on the wall in his house. And this woman came to his house asking for money. He gave her the little bit that he had and he went back into his living room and it struck him that the Lord was not pleased with his life. He heard God say to him, not well done, good and faithful servant. What he heard is thou hast adorned thy walls with the money which might have uh, cared for this poor creature in the cold. O oh, justice, O oh, mercy, are not these pictures the blood of this poor maiden? And so he determined in his life that he was going to make a difference. He put down on a piece of paper, he was an extreme type A person, like some of y'all here, I'm an extreme type B person, but we got to love each other uh, in Christ. He was a very good organizer. So he put down on paper, he determined how much he needed to live. At this time, he needed 28 pounds a year to live. So that meant making 30 pounds, he had 2 pounds to give away. The next year, he made 60 pounds. And so he lived on 28 pounds, and he gave away 32 pounds. The next year, he lived, made 90 pounds. He lived on 28 pounds, and he gave away 62 pounds. The next year, he made 120 pounds. He lived on 28 pounds, and he gave away 92 pounds to those who He said, Gain all you can. Save all you can so that you can give away all you can. That was his heart. He also told all of his pastors, do all the good you can by all the means you can and all the ways you can and all the places that you can and all the times that you can to all the people you can as long as you ever can. heart of God in the hand to men. That was the life that John Wesley lived. The life that touched so many people. At the end of Wesley's life, he wrote this, the streets do not now resign with cursing the place is no longer filled with drunkenness and uncleanness, fightings and bitterness. Peace and love are there. When many years later a young preacher visited a poor part of Cornwall, he remarked to a miner, what made the difference? What happened? And the old coal miner barred his head and said, there came a man among us. His name was John Wesley. The lives were changed. The hearts were transformed. And I thought about this because as we're coming up on our election year, and as, man, you know, I'm so tired of Facebook. I'm tired of the media. I'm tired of all the stuff and the things that are said from both sides. 
Our nation is so divided. There's so much bitterness and anger in our country. Well, that's not anything new. John Wesley had rules for voting. Did you know that? He said this, to vote without fee or reward for the person they judged most worthy. But first of all, pray about it. The Lord will lay on your heart the person most worthy to vote for. Number two, speak no evil of the person they voted against. I need to read that one again. Speak no evil of the person they voted against. Take care of the spirit. We're not sharpened against those that voted on the other side. Not only don't speak ill against another candidate you didn't vote for, but take care that there's nothing between you and someone that voted for someone on the other side. What words we can remember in this election year. One of his phrases was, untold millions are still untold. <laughs> right? On his deathbed at the age of 87, John Wesley said, the best of all, God is with us. Those were his final words. Things to remember. Now, I, I do all of this. I, I take this time. This is really the introduction. And somebody said, really? <laughs> because when I went to the Wesley Covenant Association on October the 7th, one of the things they did is just to remind us of who we are, what our roots are, what we are as United Methodists, what we are as Wesleyans. There are currently in America 7 million United Methodists. There are 13 million in the world currently. There are 80 million Wesleyans in the world. When I say about Wesleyans, that's the Nazarene Church, uh, the Salvation Army, the Assemblies of God, most Pentecostal churches, all come back from Wesleyan roots. There's a reminder that we have a heart to God and a hand to people. That God has called us in this life not just to be saved, that, that because we are saved, there's a difference in our life. And a difference in the lives of those around us. I'm going to go through some of these because I forgot to use them. I do that sometimes. Um, now, I can imagine if they had lived long enough, that Samuel and Susanna Wesley, this would have been their thoughts towards their sons. John Wesley was the heart behind the, the movement and his ability to guide and to lead and to orchestrate with his type A personality. But then Charles Wesley was also an important part of this with his heart to worship God. So we have these two men, and it was told that every United Methodist pastor was called to carry two books. We were the people of two books. One was the Bible. We always had a Bible. This is actually an early circuit writer's Bible that they would carry. It's too fine a print for me to read. And this is an 1849 hymnal of the United Methodist Church. It was small so that both of these can fit in a pocket and carry with you where we went. Charles Wesley wrote somewhere around 6,000 hymns. 
Do you know what he would do? This is great. This is what Charles Wesley would do. He would sit outside the bars and he would listen to the popular music of the day. And he would then go back and he would write lyrics to these songs. And that's where a lot of the songs, oh, 4,000 tongues to sing, came from. Then the Wesleys would rent a hall next to one of these bars. So when the bar closed at 10 o'clock, that's when they'd start worshiping. Somebody would come out of a bar. They would hear songs. Wow, it sounds like the party's still going on. And they would walk into a revival. And they would hear the gospel preach. And they'd set Christ in lives of children. Heart to God. Your heart in the hand of man. So I have another quick video. This one's a little shorter. Now, in our time, a new movement is being born. In the hearts and minds of believers who long for God to do in our time what he has done for. In the midst of a culture that is broken, hurting, and lost. At a time when the church again seems to have lost its way. Men and women are praying for a powerful move of God's Holy Spirit. They desire to join together and seek God's blessing. That the gospel might be proclaimed with power. The church might be renewed and a hurting culture might find hope and life in Jesus Christ. For the last 2,000 years, the gospel, wherever it has been proclaimed faithfully and lived out by servant communities, who love and care for the world as their Lord did. This gospel has for two millennia spoken to every culture and tribe who has heard it. Transforming hearts and bringing hope to desperate souls. In our own time, courageous servants like the early circuit riders and like Wesley himself are sharing the good news of Jesus Christ in hostile places. And with the sing a harvest any other time in history. Today, a new movement is being launched. A diverse global connection of warm-hearted Wesleyans, filled with gratitude for those who have gone before them. United by their commitment to the Orthodox Christian faith. Compelled to tell the old, old story. In the most innovative ways. Committed to the proclamation of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior dedicated to serving the poor and disenfranchised. Certain that we are to walk into the future together. And unashamed of the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God and the hope of the world. Wesleyan Covenant Association is a revival in the United Methodist Church encouraging us to get back to our heart for God pursuit as we understand the authority of the Word of God to transform people's lives. But as we also realize that God has called us because we are being transformed to transform the society in which we live. The hope and the love of Jesus Christ. It's a movement of prayer and celebration that longs for us as United Methodists to remember who we are. As Wesleyans. Reverend Dr. Jeff Greenway said this, I believe we are planting seeds today that when full grown will bear the fruit of a vital Wesleyan witness and dynamic spirit-filled Methodists across the globe. We Methodists believe in holding the tension between works of piety and works of mercy. That's what a pastor from Florida said. Rob Renfro says, what unites us is that we long to be part of a mighty movement that God uses to change the world. We did not join the United Methodist Church to debate what the Bible has made clear. We did not 
enter the ministry to save the church. We are Methodists because we want to be a part of a church that God would use to save the world. The pastor from West Africa said this, the only sustainable path to, to global unity of the people called Methodists is a total submission and loyalty, loyalty to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and an exclusive obedience to the Word of God as primary authority for our faith and Christian living. Andrew Thompson said that the church was rather called to be a light of the world, the city built on a hill, the lamp upon a lampstand giving light to the darkness. Wesley's great fear was that the Methodist movement would in a process that had happened again and again over the countries be tamed to the culture until it was nothing more than a docile lapdog. He was afraid that Methodism engaged with the culture would dilute, the culture would dilute it until it was nothing but a shell of its former self. Kenneth Livingston said this, this is very important, this is where you might want to write it down, I'm going to go fast, you ready? Salvation without sacrifice is a false God. Sanctification without submission is a false God. Mercy and grace without truth and transformation is a false God. Social holiness without scripture is a false God. Forgiveness without faithfulness is a false God. Redemption without renunciation of sin is a false God. Unity without covenant is a false God. We've set up these false gods in our denomination. The Wesley Covenant Association says we are a coalition of congregations, clergy, and laity from all jurisdictions that are committed to promoting ministry that combines a high view of Scripture, Wesleyan vitality, Orthodox theology, and Holy Spirit empowerment. We encompass a broad range of worship styles and ministry practices. What links us together is our desire to witness to the transforming power of God to change and redeem human lives and societies. We come together to support, network, and encourage one another as the future of the United Methodist Church comes into clearer focus. The Wesleyan Covenant Association is a movement within the United Methodist Church, much like the movement that John and Charles Wesley started in the Anglican Church to remind the church of what their focus is all about. Our focus is about a heart to God and a hand to people. Our focus is about loving Him, pursuing holiness, walking with Him. But that means very little if we don't transform the lives of those around us with the hope and the love Jesus Christ. And God has called us to love God. To love you. Right? That's what John Wesley was all about. It wasn't one side or the other. You can't have one without the other. He's calling all of us as we pray for Woodcrest, as we seek the Lord, as we humbly bow and cry out to Him on behalf of not only Woodcrest, Lord, may we never lose our focus. May we constantly come back to a heart for You and a hand to those around us. May we always come back to the fact that we are saved for a purpose, that we have been brought into the family of God to be the heart and the hands of Jesus and touch people's life. I covet your prayers as your pastor. We need your prayers as a congregation 
Because sometimes it is overwhelming as we see the needs in our community. But I also covet your prayers for the United Methodist Church. We don't know what it's going to look like in two years or four years. But if we stay true to a heart for God and a hand to man, God's not done with us. Lifted high, hear my song, hear my cry.